All right, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Samantha Booth. I am one of the postdoctoral fellows here on the Anxiety and Mood Service at the NYU Child Study Center. Uh, I also have um, the opportunity to work in a smaller group of clinicians that focus on tics and Tourette's disorder, as well as trichotillomania. So I'm really excited to be talking with you all today about tics and Tourette's in the classroom. So how do we collaborate and make accommodations for successful school years? Uh, you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by typing them into the questions pane, um, the control panel, which is on the right side of your screen. Um, we were going to hold questions till the end of my presentation, but um, we will be answering those questions. So let's look at the overview. So we're going to talk first about what ticks are, um, just so we have some uh, common language and understanding as to what we're looking at today. Um, how do we address ticks in schools? And what are the accommodations that can be helpful in schools specifically? So first, what are ticks? So these are neurological, not psychological disorders, which means that they're brain-based and they impact the cortical striato thalamocortical circuits in the brain. So that's is part of the brain that's really controlling our movements. And so what we pay attention to is um, just the fact that this is brain-based. This is not something that is controlled by the child and is also genetic in nature. So it can be passed down um, from parents um, and siblings may also sort of have higher occurrences of ticks together. Okay. So ticks themselves, I want to give you some understanding. These are involuntary movements and vocalizations. So we separate them into four different categories. Um, so simple ticks versus complex ticks, and then motor ticks and vocal ticks. Um, so when we think about simple ticks, these are things that are um, short. They're one tick at a time, so um, different eye movements, nose movements, whereas complex motor ticks are more um, different ticks sort of strung together. So you, we try and differentiate between those two. And the same happens for vocal ticks. So vocal ticks that are simple, we usually classify our sounds, our noises, coughing, throat clearing, and then complex phonic symptoms are more words and syllables and sentences put together. Again, these are involuntary and the child has no control over them happening. So when we think about what Tourette's disorder is, I think it's important to go back to the root. So Guillaume de la Tourette is our sort of the namesake of Tourette syndrome. And we describe this as involuntary movements of the face, arm, limbs, or trunk. Um, and most commonly, we think of facial tics as being our first tic that occurs. Um, so this is sort of where Tourette's disorder comes from. And we think about the criteria, so if you're going in for an evaluation of your tics and you're learning about the criteria that goes along with or whatever the diagnosis that you may get from um, a psychologist or a physician, is we think about Tourette's disorder, persistent chronic motor or vocal tics, and then also provisional tic disorders. So these are all very similar. I think when people hear Tourette's disorder, they think most thing, you know, out loud, we want to sort of try and you know, keep in mind what those actual symptoms are. Um, as psychologists, what we see are motor and vocal tics that are present at some time. So we know that, you know, many kids don't end up having um, tics where they're yelling out. It may be some sniffing or some grunting noises. It's not necessarily words. Whereas persistent chronic motor or vocal tics are just one type of tic without the other one ever being present. And so they can wax and wane, but they have to persist for a year for either of those diagnoses. Whereas a provisional tic disorder is um, present for less than a year. So this might be if you have a shorter history of tics, that might be the diagnosis that you get first. And if they persist, you would um, get a, a different diagnosis later on. So when we think about Tourette's disorder, this affects 12 to 18 percent of school age children. So this means that, you know, these kids may not have a diagnosis of tics or Tourette's or may have never been a do exhibit tics. Um, when we think about the prevalence of tic disorders that are diagnosed, it's about one in a hundred kids. So they do happen to, you know, come up in the school settings a lot, and so teachers will see these kids and may not necessarily know how to handle it because it's not, you know, maybe as common as some other things that they might be seeing. Um, we want to keep in mind that it affects boys at a three to five to one ratio. So it's three or five boys to one girl is um, affected by tics. 
uh, so much more prevalent in boys, affects all racial and ethnic groups. And what is interesting is that it's more commonly diagnosed among 12 to 17 year olds than 6 to 11 year olds. But what's interesting about that, and what we'll talk about, is that typically these um, are emerging between the ages of five and seven. So I think there's a big delay in terms of identification and getting um, a diagnosis of Tourette's. So in terms of comorbidity and life course, I think it's important that you know kids with tics and Tourette's also are at a higher you know risk factor, I would say for having other disorders as well. So most commonly we think about ADHD, um, intellectual disabilities or learning disorders, um, stress and anxiety, autism spectrum disorders, uh, depression, these language difficulties, OCD. And so when we think about tics, um, all of these things can co-occur. Co most commonly we see ADHD and OCD co-occurring with tics. So that's just one thing to keep in mind that a kid with trust disorder may also have another diagnosis that might be getting in the way for them. Um, what we do know about tics is that their first diagnosis or first notice at five to seven, it may take longer for a diagnosis, um, but they do tend to wax and wane throughout all of childhood and adolescence, and sometimes they will decrease in adulthood. So when we think about tics and sort of what happens as we move forward in the child's lifetime, it's the rule of a third. So for a third of kids, we know that tics will probably go away. They, they won't persist into adulthood. For a third of kids, they might decrease in severity, but they'll still be there, but not in an interfering way. And then for about a third of our kids, we, we know that they're going to have threats through their lifetime and they may get even more severe in adulthood. So just keeping in mind that we don't really have a way to predict that. Um, however, you know, there are different trajectories that kids take typically. So just some basic information to know about tics that can be helpful um, just as a parent and then also to explain to school. Tics are not intentional or purposeful. This again comes back to the fact that they're neurological in nature, not psychological. They can change and wax and wane over time. So they can, you can have an eye tick one day and potentially, you know, a week later it may turn into a nose tick or you may have the addition of a nose tick. Um, and then they wax and wane over time. And so this can happen naturally or it can be impacted by stress, um, being reminded not to tick, returning to school is a really big time when ticks get exacerbated, um, being alone, and even just talking about ticks. So they are suggestible in nature. So if you talk to a kid in your, um, in, in your child about having ticks and asking them about how their ticks are, they may be more likely to exhibit ticks when they're sitting in front of you. I think this has happened to me a lot in the office where I'll be asking about specific tics and the kid says, oh, this hasn't been happening at all this week, but I'm having the tic now. And so we want to keep in mind that it is suggestible. So if we're talking about it, it may occur. One positive thing to know is that tics can be improved by having a consistent sleep schedule, um, doing activities that require focused attention and motor control. So sports are great for these kids. Um, and you know, even art can be really helpful if they're really engaged in what they're doing. Relaxation can help improve tics and physical activity, so sports or you know, playing out on the playground. Um, and this can be really helpful for our kids who feel sort of exhausted by their tics and are looking for ways to sort of move past them or get rid of them for a certain portion of their day. One important thing to note is that when we're suppressing our tics, so kids do try and suppress tics and try and make them not occur, especially in the school setting, this can affect academic performance because what happens is kids are taking so much brain energy to try and stop the tics that are occurring that it actually keeps them from concentrating on things in the classroom that they might be missing or they, you know, they're paying so much attention to their tics that they're missing what's happening in the lecture. So it's really important that we, you know, kind of keep that in mind as we, we look at our kids with ticks. So the good news is that we have some great treatment options for uh, ticks and Tourette's. Um, the psychosocial treatments are the gold standard first line of treatment. Uh, this is the comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks. Um, it's also habit reversal training. Some people will use that. It's all encompassed in the same treatment. Um, this is our gold standard. It's shown to be effective in adults and in kids, so that's a really good news. Um, and this is something that we provide here at the Child Study Center in our group of teams, the team who works with ticks and traps. And then there's also medication as an option for kids who have more severe ticks or ticks that are not um, 
responding well to the psychosocial treatments. And so we have those options as well. We're not going to talk about treatment today specifically because we want to focus on school, but one of the most important parts of the psychosocial treatment is to have the psychologist or social worker or whomever you're working with really collaborate with the school to make sure that we're getting um, good interventions in place. So let's talk about the challenges in the school setting. So kids with ticks have lots of challenges just because they have ticks. So it might be difficulty completing homework. So potentially if there's a tick that's impacting their arms or their movements, uh, they may have a difficult time sort of getting pen to paper or even just you know, sitting down to do work. Um, another issue that a lot of these kids have is disorganization. So not knowing where their papers are, the backpack comes home and it's sort of an explosion. And when you open it, it looks like you have no idea kind of what's going on in the backpack um, in terms of having folders and having things put in place. Handwriting issues are definitely an issue that come up. So kids will come home and say, oh, I can't even read my writing. I don't even know what it says. And that could be because they're trying to suppress ticks in the classroom or potentially that the ticks are getting in the way of their writing. Perfectionism is another thing that comes up. Difficulty paying attention, potentially because they're having attentional difficulties outside of ticks or just because they're so, so focused on, you know, trying not to tick in the classroom. Uh, difficulty transitioning and following directions. The idea of transitioning can cause really a lot of stress and we know, I mean, especially in high school, the time between classes for kids is so short. So it's, you know, possible that, you know, those transitions can exacerbate ticks and can make the child feel really stressed. Um, differences in verbal and performance scores on IQ, um, just something to keep in mind if you're ever getting um, psychological testing or neuropsychological testing. Uh, sensory difficulties, stress and anxiety, um, impulsivity and oppositional behaviors, social skill difficulties, be it by social skill deficits, so maybe not having the skills to talk to other kids your age or feeling too anxious because of your tics to want to engage in social interactions with others. And then finally, bullying is another thing that comes up for these kids with tics. And I think that's the unfortunate nature because there is sort of a, a visible difficulty that these kids are having, um, there is bullying that occurs. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. But I also want to keep in mind that these kids also can have comorbid executive dysfunction, autism spectrum disorders, anxiety and mood disorders, learning disabilities, obsessions and compulsions related to OCD, um, ADHD, and sleep problems. So all of these things together make it really challenging potentially for a kid with tics to be able to get through um, school and get through their day-to-day -day life. And so we want to make sure that we're paying attention to all of the comorbidities um, that could potentially come up for a child with Tourette. So how do we address this in schools? We take a three-pronged approach, and I think a lot of this can be done by parents on their own, and I also think it's really helpful to have a guide or um, someone that you're working with to help you with advocating for yourself in the school, communicating with the school, and accommodating ticks in the school setting. So first, in terms of the advocating and communicating, we want parents and kids to advocate for themselves in the schools. We want to help parents model for teachers and for peers how do we accept ticks? Um, and we also recommend that kids advocate for themselves by at educating their classmates about ticks. Um, one thing that I have you know, had many middle schoolers and even some high schoolers do is to create a presentation about what ticks are, where do they come from, what do they look like, what am I doing to work on my ticks, and do a presentation. So even as formal as doing a PowerPoint presentation, can help other kids understand what's going on. And what I have to say, it actually helps teachers and the school understand what's going on better too. Um, so I think that's a really great intervention that we can put in place that you know, many schools are really open to. I think it's also important to communicate often with teachers and school staff. So be that through a daily report card or a journal that you send back and forth to school. Um, I know with email, it's also much easier probably to get in contact with teachers. So if the teacher that you're working with does have email, I really recommend getting in contact with them so that you can understand what's happening in the classroom because we know that ticks can look different in the classroom than at home. Um, we also recommend that people get involved with the community. So the Tourette Association of America um, has a great organization. Um, there are local chapters in New York City and New Jersey um, and all over the country. So getting involved and advocating 
through that group and also meeting other kids and um, in parents who have kids with Tourette's as well can be really helpful. So in terms of what do we do in the classroom, which is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time thinking about accommodations, um, I want to talk about the different types of accommodations first. So one, we have informal com accommodations and formal accommodations. In terms of informal accommodations, what that refers to is when we are um, just working with a teacher and asking a teacher to implement, you know, different uh, strategies or skills within the classroom. So um, I do this a lot, and there are a lot of wonderful teachers who are really dedicating, dedicated to helping kids sort of get what they need in the classroom. Um, I think what can become challenging is that because it's informal, it's not actually required for the school to do that, and so things sometimes go by the wayside. Um, one thing that I've done for families who want to go the informal accommodation route is to make a sheet um, with a list of facts about ticks and traps and about the accommodations and recommendations that I have made. So that's one of the ways that we can do this. Um, formal accommodations, I think, provide more, um, more uh, protection for the child in the classroom because it, it is sort of a legal document and it also sort of puts into place more structure, I would say, for the accommodations that we're trying to put in place. Uh, so one is a 504 plan, which is, um, you know, testing accommodations, less formalized, versus the IEP classification, which is through the Committee for Special Education. Um, usually kids with Tourette's are given an other health impairment uh, classification on their IEP. Um, the reason I would say to go the formal accommodation route is I worked with a kid um, a while ago where we had these informal accommodations in place. I had done a training with the school. I had talked to them about what ticks are, you know, it's helping the school understand that they want to ignore the ticks and, you know, allow the kid to take breaks if necessary. Um, and this is a child who happened to have vocal ticks. And every report card, every marking period, the kid would come home and on their, marking, their report card it would say, um, you know, calls out in class, um, doesn't always follow directions, and it was really hard for the kid to see that because I, this is a very compliant kid. I could never imagine him calling out. Maybe it happened once or twice, but it was his tics actually that were happening in the classroom. And so on his record, it said, oh, you know, he's calling out in the classroom, and that really wasn't the case. It was really the tics. Um, and so the family was really frustrated by that, and the school was really frustrated that we were frustrated by that. And so that's actually when we went to the formal accommodation route, to make it more formalized, to make it so that, you know, something like this wouldn't happen again. And it, we did do that, and it's been so helpful now, kind of, the, the kid doesn't have those things on the report card anymore. And it feels good for the kid, it feels good for the parent, it feels good for me, and it feels good for school so that they know what's going on as well. Um, you know, in terms of IEP meetings, we want to make sure that, you know, you are the expert on your child. So being able to provide that information to school is so valuable. And so don't be intimidated by the group of people sitting at the table who are trying to make all of these decisions. You're the expert on your kid. And so making sure that you um, are able to relay what you know and what your child's frustrations are. Um, and always ask questions and feel comfortable to do so because you're entitled to it. Um, in terms of what accommodations we would recommend for a child with tics, um, I separated this into a couple of different sections. So first, let's think about general rules in the classroom setup. What we want to stress to teachers, and if we're doing informal or formal accommodations, it doesn't matter. Ignore the tics in the classroom. If they're not disruptive, let it be. Because what's happening is kids are trying to suppress to, you know, act a certain way in the room and it's getting in the way of their learning. So by ignoring the ticks, thinking of it as sort of a dripping faucet in the classroom, it might be annoying, but it's not impacting anyone in the classroom. Um, if the ticks are more interfering, if it's louder calling out, we want to allow the child to leave the room, but not ask the child to leave the room. So the child should be able to make the decision on whether or not they need to leave the room. But when you ask a child, it sort of brings attention to the fact that people are noticing their tics. And so we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, I think what we can do is put a safe space in the school, have frequent breaks, use a pass system. I have a kid that I'm working with now who, you know, gives a little salute to their, um, their teacher in the classroom so that they know that, you know, they need a break. And so they'll walk out and nobody has to know what's going on. It's sort of set up in a nice way. Um, in terms of seating in the classroom, we want to remember that um, kids being watched 
is who have ticks, it's going to exacerbate their ticks. And so we want to allow the child to sit in the back of the classroom if possible. Um, what, where this gets tricky is if we have kids who also have a comorbid ADHD diagnosis, we want them in the front of the classroom. And so we'll try and find a place sort of over on the side where the kid doesn't feel like they're the center of attention in terms of their ticks, and then also um, having space to also have um, be at the front of the class for their ADHD. And one other thing is allowing the child to leave class a minute early so that they can transition and not be overwhelmed by the stressful environment of transitioning. In terms of stress in the classroom, so we know that stress exacerbates ticks, and I think that teachers have been doing much, much more of this, I would say, over kind of my training, kind of where I am now. I've seen teachers really incorporating relaxation techniques during class, allowing movement breaks during class, um, or allowing stress balls or fidgets in the classroom. And so one thing that's really nice about this intervention is it doesn't have to just be your child who is um, you know, singled out for um, you know, using using relaxation techniques. It actually can be applied to the entire classroom. It's not going to hurt anyone. And so, you know, I have this picture here of them doing a movement break. That's a great way to help incorporate that into the day. Um, stress balls or fidgets in the classroom, I think, are another thing as long as teachers are comfortable with it. Um, I think, you know, silly putty or there's different types of putty out there can be really helpful um, or something like a koosh ball. Whatever your child feels most comfortable with, just letting the teacher know ahead of time um, that your child needs that um, in order to sort of help um, reduce stress within the classroom. In terms of academic support, I think this is where we get really creative in terms of what each individual child needs. So I want to kind of provide the caveat that while a lot of these accommodations can be helpful, and they may not be helpful for all kids with ticks and traps, and so we want to be creative about which accommodations we're using. But some of the typical things that we'll recommend is extra time on tests and providing a separate location for testing. So this can be helpful in terms of um, helping the child feel less anxious about their ticks while taking a test because they're not being watched by anyone. It gives them sort of a separate place to be able to have ticks and also complete their exam. Um, and extra time can be helpful, especially for kids who um, have a hard time with their motor ticks, especially if it interferes with their writing. Um, a lot of these kids have a really difficult time organizing themselves, so providing organizational skills support, so be that formally through the school or with a psychologist, there are organizational skills trainings. Um, whatever, you know, is op uh, open to you, and then also as a parent you can help organize your kid as well. So having folders for different classes, making sure that everything's labeled, and helping the child organize at the end of each day can be immensely helpful for these kids. Um, we also want to break down our larger assignments, so helping, you know, for a big book report or a term report that's happening, how do I break this down into smaller steps? And also considering ways to reduce the workload if it's becoming overwhelming. We also, for many kids, we can allow assistive technology, so one thing that schools are doing is they do an evaluation on if an assistive technology would be helpful, um, so that's one way um, to get that academic support. And then finally, be mindful of group work as well, just because it can be difficult for a child to manage their stress and anxiety about their tics and then also engage in the group. Which brings us to bullying. Uh, so we want to do our best to prevent bullying. And so while we can't control what other kids do, what other you know, teachers are doing, we want to help your child find a trusted adult in the school. Um, so either a counselor or a teacher. Um, if we know that teasing is happening, providing extra supervision. Um, work with administration to have a specific system for how they're going to document and report bullying because we always want to make sure that there's a record of that if that is um, occurring on an ongoing basis. And one thing I like to think about, um, you know, a lot of New York City kids do not take a bus to school, but if they are taking a bus, there is a bus driver. I think it's really essential to have the bus driver involved in the discussions about ticks because I think it allows them to have an understanding of what's going on for this child and then they can keep an extra eye as your child is going to and from school. But I think the last thing I want to just focus on is that kids with ticks have a lot of strengths. So they have a lot of challenges, but they have difficult or they have a lot of strengths as well. So they're funny, they're intelligent, and they have a lot of other things going for them that we also want to focus on. A child with trust disorder is not just a child who has ticks, they have a lot of other strengths as well. So keeping all of that in mind, um, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So thank you.
Um, so I'm going to take the first question. So what if teachers are resistant to accommodations in the classroom? This is a great question. And I think when I was talking about the formal versus informal accommodations, that would be a time, I think, to really go for the um, formal accommodations. You are entitled as a parent to request an IEP evaluation or a special education evaluation. Um, you write a letter to your school and they will start that process. Um, and then at that point, teachers don't, if they don't want to, that's fine, but they are legally required to through whatever is put on the IEP. And so um, I hate to go that round to be sort of confrontational in that way, but in some cases, teachers have a really hard time managing all of the things going on in the classroom plus these informal accommodations. So our next question is, is there a specific term or psychological test needed to see if my child has TREP? So what I typically recommend in terms of assessment for tics and trots is to have a psychological or psychiatric evaluation done or a neurological evaluation. These would be the different routes to go. Um, what I would say is that when you have these evaluations, they can screen for many, many different things that are potentially going on psychologically from a mental health standpoint. And if you have a concern specifically about Tourette, let that person know um, so that they can have assessments ready to assess ticks. There are some really great tools that um, clinicians can use to get a really good sense of what's going on. So our next question is, um, what types of advocacy do you encourage middle schoolers and teens to do in school? Um, so this is something that I've been really working on, a lot of the kids that I'm working with currently. So one thing is the Tread Association of America has um, cards that you can give out saying, I have Tourette's, I, I can't control the behavior, so you can hand that out if, you know, a, a child is, feels uh, open to doing that. Um, the Tread Association of America also has an advocacy um, kind of training and leadership training that they do in Washington, D.C. So all of these things are kids with trust can become involved with. I think having, making presentations at school um, and, you know, either doing that in front of the entire school, which I've had some kids do, or even little presentations at the beginning of each class, or if you're in one classroom the whole day, doing a longer presentation, this can really help a child feel like they can assert that, yes, like, I do have ticks and or ticks or Tourette's, um, but that doesn't mean that I can't, you know, I, I'm not as normal as anybody else in the school. Is there any information specific to kids with autism and Tourette's? I think that's a great question as well. I think um, there are specialists in autism who um, have specialties and, and trust as well. Um, I would say that I think, you know, really finding someone who has expertise in both of those things can help um, kind of get you that information. I think that's something that you can get when, you, when you're looking for someone to work with your child, making sure that they have um, sort of expertise in both. Okay, this is the last question. Um, so my child is just five, but we had an early diagnosis, so two and a half years. Um, however, her tics are relatively mild. My question is about starting IEP this early. Her preschool did not have concerns, but now she's in public kindergarten. What's your advice? I think this is a really great question. This is, um, you know, not knowing this child, it makes it hard to give a firm answer to this. Um, I might talk with the public kindergarten teachers and the guidance counselor just to see what they're recommending, what their thoughts are. I think that schools are open to collaborative communication. I think that many schools are really, they don't want to put an IEP in place if it's not necessary, um, but I think they would be open to having that conversation. One way to go about this is also to get a 504 plan, so something that is not as um, uh, encompassing as an IEP, but maybe starting with a 504 plan, which would give testing a combination. Um, because your child is so young, I think, you know, there are pros and cons to starting the IEP. So just talking that out with your guidance counselor, um, the school psychologist, whomever you have contact with at the school. Um, that was our last question. Um, so I just want to thank you on behalf of the Child Study Center for joining today. Um, when you leave the webinar, there's going to be a survey that would be sent to you, and we would love it if you could have, um, complete that for us. Um, and then within a day or two of this webinar, you will also get an email with a link to today's recording. And then finally, um, we would love for you to join us for our next webinar. It's the importance of social skills, the what and how of making and keeping friends. It's on October 4th, 2016 with um, Kate Sullivan. So uh, please come and sign up and register. 
Um, again, that's Tuesday, October 4th at 1 o'clock. And thank you again.